good morning and welcome to this service of worship. It is so good to be here together. My name is Pam White. I'm the senior pastor, and it is good to have you with us for the service of worship. Whether you're a member of First Rowlett or whether you're a guest that has found us online, we are glad that you are here, especially in this time where we've been surrounded by reminders of the pain and the brokenness in our society. We lean on our faith as a foundation, and I'm glad to be here with you today for the service of worship. I hope you'll take just a minute to register your attendance because it's important to know that you're here. We've got lots of ways you can do that. You can reply in the comment section, you can send an email, or you can fill out the registration form that's online. On our website, we've got lots of different opportunities, ways that you can engage with our congregation in this time when we aren't able to be together physically. We've got lots of life groups that continue to meet each and every week on Zoom that are continuing to have conversations, to support each other with prayer, and to go through studies. We've got different individual Bible studies. We've got Facebook groups, and we've got ways that you can reach out and help us with mission opportunities. But one of the things that we're most excited about is that next week, our Vacation Bible School session will begin. On Saturday, we're going to have a drive through party in our parking lot, way to kick this off. People will get a Vacation Bible School in a box and be able to take it home and then engage in all the different sessions that we usually have with crafts and games and skits and songs and then a closing session on Zoom where we'll get together together and have some fun. If you haven't registered yet, I hope that you will do that. And if you're able to help volunteer, to donate anything, we still have some needs and I hope you'll go online and find those. It's wonderful to be the church together. And it's wonderful to be here this morning to worship together. Please join me in our call to worship. Oh God, you created all people in your image, but our actions don't always honor this truth. We struggle to understand the reality of racial injustice and inequality. We ask you to guide our hearts and minds as we focus on how to heal so much pain. Teach us to listen to one another and give us the words to say in response. May our actions help to make our world a better place for all, regardless of the color of our skin. As we worship this hour, show us your presence in our love for all your children. Jesus, united by thy grace, and each to each and Please join me as we affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today's scripture comes from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, 
the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You know, Jesus' life is filled with examples of him praying privately and also in communion with others. We, too, pray privately, and we now join together in prayer as a community of faith. So please pray with me. Holy and loving God, when we look around our world and our community, we see so much pain, so much brokenness, such a lack of peace. Sometimes we don't know how to respond faithfully. Sometimes we focus on ourselves instead of on others. Sometimes we forget to reach out to you before we speak and act. Our hearts are broken for the family of George Floyd. Our hearts are broken when we see the pain of others. Our hearts break when we recognize the oppression and hate that surrounds us. But we need your help in knowing how to respond. God, we pray that you help us keep our focus on you first, on your love. We pray for the strength and the courage to faithfully follow your great commandment to love you first and most and to love others as much as we love ourselves. Help us to withhold judgment and to share grace. Help us to remember that you created us in your image, all of us. We pray for those who are impacted by racism, for our police officers, for our families, for those who are grieving. We also pray for wisdom and for guidance. And God, we lift up those to you who are struggling with the impact of COVID-19 and pray for healing. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ as we pray together the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We say this every week.
but it's important for you to know that we appreciate your financial support of First Rowlett United Methodist Church. We are grateful that you value the ministries and missions of this church and make them possible. And now, please pray with me. Holy and gracious God, you count on us to be generous with the blessings you have given us. Help us, God, to remember that tithes and offerings are the result of your love for us. Thank you for bringing us together as a church and for bringing us together with you to do the work you have called us to do. We ask that you bless the gifts that are presented, whether online or by mail, and may they be used to accomplish your will, your ministries, your mission. In Jesus' name, amen. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're continuing in this series that we've been calling Fiery Faith. We've been talking about the fact that sometimes our faith needs to be set on fire. We're looking at different passages where God either appears as fire or fire is used to help us recognize some extraordinary characteristic of God. Fire gets our attention. It's something that we notice. And so it's our hope that in studying these scriptures, they will get our attention and we will notice God's presence in new ways. Today we're looking at the story of Moses and his encounter with the burning bush. This is probably in the top 10 of the most recognized Bible stories. But the thing I love about these familiar passages is that they still have new truths to speak to us. The Bible has been called the living, breathing word of God. And this phrase captures the fact that scripture, even though the words were written so long ago, it is still alive in the way that it speaks to us today. And I definitely found that to be true in this passage today as we look at this fiery encounter 
that Moses has. We usually plan out our general worship topics well in advance, sometimes a year ahead. And that was true of this one. We had already picked this passage for today. But as I read it this week and prepared for today's sermon, I was reminded of the way that Scripture meets us where we are. The pain and the brokenness of our society reached a boiling point in the last couple of weeks. We've had a spotlight on the racial injustices that are far too prevalent. And this has reminded us of the ways that racism and prejudice is not a thing of the past in the history books, but instead we've seen the ways that it is in full force today. It's easy to throw our hands up in frustration, not knowing what it is that we have the power to do. But through scripture, we encounter the example of God's faithful followers. Those who are called by God for a particular purpose. Maybe this will help us to understand our own calling a little better. In this passage, we join Moses at the beginning of his ministry. These verses start out by telling us that he was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. He was a common shepherd. He was out wandering with these animals and went a little beyond his normal area. It was then that Moses notices something that catches his eye. I'm guessing that any fire out in these parts probably would get someone's attention, but this fire seemed different. It was burning, but it was not consuming the bush. There was something extraordinary about this fire. This passage does not mince words. It gets right to the point, and within a couple of verses, we find out what is extraordinary about this bush. Moses realizes the presence of God. Through this bush, Moses hears the Lord call out to him, Moses, Moses. In this case, just to be sure to get Moses' attention, there was both a visual representation and an audible voice as well. God had a critical message, and God wanted to be sure that Moses didn't miss it. God was calling Moses to something important. Did you notice that he had to say his name twice? Moses, Moses. We find this same thing in other places in Scripture. This is also present in the call of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 and in the call of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Sometimes God has to work to get our attention. I'm guessing Moses may have wandered into this same area many times through the years as he had cared for these sheep and nothing like this had ever happened before. He was just going about his business, and he was interrupted by the presence of God. I love the way this passage shows God meeting him where he is. Moses is on this mountain doing his business. He's shepherding his flock and carrying out the work that he does every day. And it is there that God breaks in. Too often we think we have to travel to some special place or, or to step out of our everyday setting in order to find God's presence. And this passage reminds us of the way that God can interrupt us anywhere at any time. God finds us. God meets us where we are. Once God has Moses' attention, he says, take off your sandals. He tells him that he is standing on holy ground. It is as if God is telling Moses to remove the things that can get in the way. Remove the things that you are using to protect yourself. Clear away the barriers. As you come to listen to me, I want you to be more vulnerable. Can you imagine the different thoughts and emotions that must have been going through his head in that moment? We can learn a lot from the ways that God calls to Moses. But I think that we can also relate in so many ways to Moses' response as well. I would love to say that Moses was awed by the presence of God and that he immediately signed on. But in Moses, we find a much more human and relatable response. When he initially hears God's call, he says 
here I am. He's ready and he's willing. He recognizes God's presence. He's ready to listen to what it is that God has to say. It's all good at that point. But then God lays out the task that is in front of him. What Moses begins to do is to take on a bit of a different response, a little bit of a different edge. He's saying, you want me to do what? If we read on past these verses that we read today, we find that Moses spends his part of the conversation laying out excuses, objections, reasons that he's not the right one. This could be my life story. Come on, can you relate to that as well? That's our first reaction. And when Moses' objections and excuses aren't enough, he finally just says to God, please send someone else. And this is one of the things that I really like about this passage. Moses is by far the best and the greatest of the prophets who are called to carry out God's work. He's the great leader of God's great people. And yet, the reality is that in these verses, we see someone who is just as lost as you and me. We find someone here who didn't expect to be called to anything big. We see a man who resisted the things that his faith calls him to do. We hear someone who is full of excuses. But in the end, we also see someone who gives us a great example of what it means to trust in God. Someone who makes himself available to be used by God to fulfill God's purposes. God did have a job for Moses to do. And Moses is finally able to realize that it is not because of his own ability that he will be able to accomplish the task that is at hand. But it is because of his ability to trust in God's leading. It is not the work that he will do, but it is the work that God will do through him that will make a difference. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a burning bush in front of us. God is calling us to an important task. The racial tensions in our midst have risen to a point where we cannot ignore them any longer. As people of faith, we must consider where we are being called to respond. In the letter that I sent this week, I talked about our baptismal covenant and the ways that it applies to our particular situation. And that means that as Christians, we push back against the evil, the injustice, and the oppression that is present in the disease of racism. But when I teach anyone about these baptismal vows, I like to talk about the fact that the first part of this vow is equally as important to understand. It starts by asking if we accept the freedom and the power that God gives us to resist the evil, the injustice, and the oppression that presents itself in so many different forms. That's a whole conversation in itself, isn't it? This is important because it shows that we have to be active in the process and that we have a choice. We have the freedom to choose how we will respond. Like Moses, we can resist and we can object But then, like Moses, we have to decide whether we will answer this call. It's critical to realize that through God, we are given not only the freedom, but we are given the power to respond as well. God empowers us, and God will use us to help fulfill God's purposes. In my letter, I talked about some of the ways that I am hearing God calling me in this instance. I shared that I've wrestled with what it means to use this power that God has made available so that I may participate in the changes that are needed. This involves taking the time to listen and to try to more fully understand the problem and the far-reaching impacts. I must recognize my blind spots and the places where I am a part of the problem 
even as I think I'm working towards a solution. Boy, that solution part is something that we want to get to, isn't it? We're anxious to reach the other side of this, to just have it all behind us. This just breaks my heart. It's hard to see the pain that surrounds us, the pain of those impacted by racism, the pain of those who are struggling to have their voice heard. And it's also disheartening to see the destruction and the violence that have resulted in so many places. This isn't what God wants. As Christians, we don't advocate for violence and we don't believe that we should condone violence. But we also need to look at how this is a terrible symptom of a bigger problem. We cannot allow the violence to shield us from seeing the deeper problem and the brokenness that lies beneath it. It can't keep us from still doing the hard work to do the deep listening. Sometimes the pain and the brokenness is so deeply buried beneath layer after layer of protective adaptation. It takes a while to get down to the source. It takes a while for us to unravel this systemic brokenness, to recognize our part in it and to turn toward a solution. As I listen to various responses from people this week, I've heard a frustration that results from not having all the answers. We don't really know what the solution is, and like I said, it makes us want to just throw up our hands in frustration as we feel helpless. But then I got to thinking that that may be part of the problem. We are so used to being able to encounter a complicated situation to give it a good intellectual analysis and to get it all figured out. We want to exercise our expert ability to suggest solutions and to solve this difficult problem. But the fallacy in this is that we continue to do this from our own perspective. In order to make any progress, we have to have more voices that speak into this. We have to understand each other better. We've talked about the importance of developing empathy. Empathy is important because it keeps us from being stuck in our own perspective. Empathy allows us to understand another person's thoughts, their feelings, to understand their condition from their point of view rather than from our own. I've shared this quote from Carl Rogers before. He's a counselor that did a lot of work in the area of empathy. And he said that it is impossible to be accurately perceptive of another's inner world if you've already formed an evaluative opinion of that person. In other words, the labels, the judgments, the assumptions that we create end up preventing us from connecting with one another. When we encounter behavior that we don't understand or that we can't relate to, there's a human tendency to want to fill in the blanks ourselves. One way that we do this is by creating labels to try to make sense of something that we don't understand or by judging behavior. And what Carl Rogers is saying that the minute that we do this, that pre this prevents us from being able to do that deep listening that is critical that step that we need to have true empathy. If we've already formed this evaluative opinion, any listening that happens is done through that lens. But the only way to move forward with this problem, as I said, is to have more voices at the table, to try to understand each other more fully. This is what Jesus was best at. This is what we saw him doing over and over in his ministry to look for those who are hurting, to look for those who didn't have a voice. And he met them with compassion. We've got to spend time in conversation. We need to spend time with those who are different from us. What if we had conversations with each other with the only goal being to understand someone else's lived experience? to hear from their perspective, not to try to persuade, to convince, or to change someone else, but just to try to better understand each other. I believe God is calling us to a new conversation. What can we learn from Moses 
in this? Where is God calling us to get our attention? He called Moses' name two times. How many times has he called out to us? How is God interrupting us in our midst, meeting us where we are to call us to this task? How are we called to take off our sandals and to realize that we are standing on holy ground? How are we called to be vulnerable as we listen to God's call? What barriers do we need to get out of the way? Most of us would not label our vocational calling as being that of a prophet. But I believe that each of these biblical prophets can teach us something about what it means to walk faithfully as people who fulfill God's will. It is through the prophets that we meet the God who promises to protect and restore God's people even as they are in the midst of great suffering and at the edge of despair. Prophets remind people of God's promises. They encounter God's good news in extraordinary ways, but then they don't keep it for themselves. Instead, they allow this good news to move them to action. They follow God's leading They allow themselves to be used by God to fulfill God's promises. And they call others to action as well. They remind others that everyone plays an important part in bringing about the kingdom of God. We are called to be prophets who use our voice to help make a change. If it is through the prophets that we meet a God who promises to protect and restore God's people, then we are in the need of a prophet in our midst. If the prophets are the ones who recognize the suffering and despair, then we are a society who needs to hear a prophetic voice. We may argue and resist and come up with millions of excuses for why we are not the right ones for this task. We may even tell God, just send someone else to do it. But it is my prayer that we will learn from the faithfulness of Moses. Moses receives a strong reminder and assurance that we heard read in this passage in verse 12. God says, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. Moses willingly allows himself to be used by God to help bring about the justice that needs to happen for God's people, and then he walks with them as they seek something new. May we walk together as God uses us to make a change. Let us pray. Gracious God, we hear your calling. We hear your calling through the pain that surrounds us, through the voices that cry out, through the conversations we have with one another where we just don't know what to do. God, we ask that you would open our hearts to recognize you right in front of us. God, help us to trust in your power The power that says this isn't on our shoulders. It's not something that we have to do by ourselves, God. But help us to trust in your leading, in your guiding. Let us open ourselves to be a channel of your love, of your reconciliation, of your healing. Let us be people who spread your love and who help to heal this brokenness. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want
know God calls us to be the church. It's so wonderful to be surrounded by so many people that have a heart for sharing the love of Christ, for doing the deep listening, and for working to figure out where we can make a change. If you're looking for a church family to be a part of, if you're looking for a group of people to walk beside you on this faith journey, we would love to have you as a part of First Rowlett. You can call the pastoral care line, and I would love to talk to you, or Dretha would as well, about your faith journey and what it means to join First Rowlett. We also have a prayer request form online if there's anything we can do to support any of you It is important for us to be the church together anytime, but especially in this time. And so as we go forth about our day, as we walk through this week, I hope that you will be reminded of the reality that God's love goes before us. May you be surrounded by the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen.